Welcome to Real Talk, Real Estate Discussions with Andrew Kirsch. In each episode, Andrew interviews industry leaders. We'll hear their real-time opinions on today's market, their background and unique career highlights, and guidance for newcomers into the industry. You can find this show at scalarkirsch.com and on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. Now here's the host of Real Talk, Andrew Kirsch. Episode 54, hope everyone had a great Memorial Day, which is the unofficial start of summer. Usually the summer means a slower transactional volume period. This whole year has been a slow transactional volume period. So maybe the summer will bring transactions. Coincidentally, the last couple of weeks, we've seen an uptick in transactions, distressed hotel deal, distressed office deal, some additional uh, apartment deals. So is it a uh, the start of, of of a wave of transactions, or is it just a blip uh, with some random deals here and there? Time will tell. On this week, we have Dana Sales, the founder of 360, a land use and entitlement permitting uh, consulting company. Uh, Dana helps a lot of my clients uh, handle the entitlement process throughout many of the Southern California jurisdictions. We talk about the state of land development, entitlement development. We talk about the cities that are pro-development, who aren't pro-development. And it'll surprise you on how the state is trying to get the entitlement process um, more streamlined to support the development of housing, any type of housing, yet some of the cities, including Los Angeles, doesn't seem to have gotten the message that we are supposed to be more streamlined in approving these projects. Anyway, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dana Sales. Hello, welcome to another edition of Real Talk. I'm here with my good friend, Dana Sales, founder of 360. Dana, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Andrew? Doing great. Well, you seem so chill now. Uh, now that your second son just had his bar mitzvah, congratulations. You, you feel you like you've accomplished everything. Uh, you know, mom warrior. <laughs> <laughs> Going to do it all. I love it. Uh, well, Dana, uh, I know you from so many different capacities from uh, you helping tons of my clients in land use and, and entitlements, uh, you helping me personally with them. Uh, what else? Uh, being a wild DI mentor to me, I guess, or uh, Sherpa, uh, leading me through that path. We could talk about that. But first, let's just start. What is 360? Well, it's funny. You were actually, I think, there when I had like conceived of this whole thing, right? This came out of wild DI. Uh, year, when right? you say conceived, you mean your kids or the, yeah, or well, you both. mean so it both. Um, <laughs> but wasn't there when that, when those were conceived? Right. So I have this long, long history of planning entitlements, real estate development coming out of the last cycle. And frankly, I was burned out of them all. And then having my kids and going through wild DI and really focusing on, on things like priorities and, and, you know, following something that you love was one of those big themes that um, we went through in that leadership program. And I wrote this business plan. I said, what what if in LA there was like a one-stop shopping place where people could do, you know, planning, entitlements, community engagement, permit expediting all in one shop. And you didn't have to like hire one person that did this and one person that did that and have five people. And it was institutional memory. And So at the end of 2012, I launched this company that was just kind of an idea. And we actually were just ranked number four on the lobbying list. I have one private company ahead of me. The others are law firms. So we have, you know, I have like the second largest practice in LA that now does this, right? So it came out. It's now been uh, 12 years. Wow. That is, I mean, it is crazy to think back that that program right. of why, well, uh, what was a young leadership young development Institute. Institute. All right. Whoever came up with that name, 
It's terrible. I mean, not a good name, but the idea of of taking 20 of us in our what early 30s, early to mid 30s and helping us become leaders uh, and you look at everyone in that group and I think pretty much we've all been quite successful in in in, in our own uh, discipline within real estate. And, and so focusing on you, Dana, and because uh, I don't want to focus on me, uh, that's uh, uh, you're on my show here uh, so we can focus on you. Um, what let's say I'm a, I'm, I'm developing, you know, a, a multifamily project. When when do I come to you and what can you do for me? So in an ideal world, I right, my strength is really like visioning and strategy. We really excel. And I think one of the things that clients come to us most for is is like while they're looking at, at even making an offer on the property is basically what can I do here and helping them understand the numbers, parameters in order to actually even make an offer. Um, we work best when, frankly, we're brought in from the very, very, very beginning before there's even a project. And we will do full site diligence, run numbers, look at all the overlays. Um, I actually had a client come the other day who was like, look, I did all this work. And I said, yes, but you missed this, this, and this. And they were like, oh, I didn't even know any of that existed. <laughs> right. And some of them were like massive, you know. There was a parcel map on the property that nobody had had dealt with and there are all these easements and things that nobody looked at right they just didn't understand so when if we can evaluate a property tell you what you can do then it's incumbent upon somebody to either go get the deal go hire an architect go figure out your building and then we will generally take it through entitlements work with the cities whatever jurisdiction it is um work with the communities, work with the council members, right? Tee it all up for whatever level of approvals are needed and or try and work somebody out of the necessity of approvals. Because now there's all these state laws, particularly for residential development that, right, if we can actually avoid a public process, a lot of our, a lot of our work these days is actually doing that, is keeping people out of public process these days. And, um, and then once it's all done, if we get approvals, we can also then help with building permits. We have people that come to us for any, all, none, and all the above, like just permitting, just outreach, just entitlements, sometimes just strategy, diligence, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, a number of my clients are brokers, right? So we're making sure they don't list the wrong information on their listing packages <laughs> or misrepresent something, right? Lenders who are looking to make right hard money loans and want to evaluate deals as they come. So it's not all development. Um, we have like a massive restaurant and hospitality practice. So it's fast food restaurants and a couple of the very, very, very large chains where we're doing right stores all over California. So it's, it's anything and above. Now, one of the most common questions uh, I'll get from clients who are looking to do a development project is, you know, do I need an attorney or, or I will even say, you know, I don't think you need an attorney. I think you should talk to Dana. Um, what, what, what are, what is your role and what is a land use lawyer's role when it comes to development and entitlements and permitting? How do you guys work together? in a complimentary way because it seems like you guys were complimentary you're not um Correct. you're you're not competitors in some cases we're competitors you know there are some large law firms that want to want to do it all but sure. in all honesty i say to my clients all the time like 95 percent of everything the lawyers do we can do it in some cases i can do it better because we're very deep in the code we're half the price Right. I'm not I don't have. Well, I, I have sort of have lawyers, <laughs> lawyers rates these days, but a um, lot less expensive. You don't need, you know, a paralegal or a junior lawyer at five hundred dollars an hour filling out forms. You just you just don't. Yeah. So we take on we tend to work best with law firms where. Where we're working hand in hand to protect clients or entities from from legal challenge and legal exposure. 
Um, and then our best working relationships are where, where whoever we're partnering with is really overseeing um, the environmental review and really like making sure that the technical studies are sound and defensible and that the record is appropriate in the event of um, you know, future legal challenge. So we're generally the ones doing the legwork and dealing with staff and dealing with forms and um, do a lot of public speaking and representing at hearings. And then the, the law firms are generally, and the lawyers we work with generally working as part of the team. Um, and that, that's the, the best relationship. Again, there are firms that do it all. Um, we don't have lawyers on a vast majority of our projects. Um, if we're doing our job right, we don't need lawyers. Yeah. Now, you know, L.A., you know, people say people refer to Los Angeles, right? But there's the city of Los Angeles, which is, what, four million or so people. But then there's so many surrounding cities from Beverly Hills, Culver City, Santa Monica, West Hollywood. And I can go on and on. But those yep. that don't live in Southern California may not recognize that when we were talking about L.A., we're really talking about the jet, the 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 county, the L.A. County, right? L.A. County. Met, I, I call it Metro Los Angeles, which includes L.A. County surrounding jurisdictions and the city. Sure. Now, each of these cities have their own codes. Um, how do you become an expert in all of these municipalities and how do you establish relationships with all of these cities? It's a great question because... Um, Right. What translates to one city does not translate to another. So, yeah. um, you know, my real expertise is in the city of Los Angeles, um, the behemoth world of the city of L.A. And there's very few of us that really know the code and know kind of the system. And if you can get around L.A., you can pretty much go anywhere because you go into a small city like Culver, um, where, you know, I have also deep relationships from being on the planning commission for many years. But the code is very simple and it's very straightforward and it's very easy to understand. And we as planners, you know, I've been trained for my entire career how to how to read codes and ordinances the same way. Right. As a lawyer, you know how to read a brief like I want to drill a hole in my head when I have to read right legislation and I have to go on and find bills like they don't read well. They're not understandable. Right. Got lawyers for that. I understand code. So. Um, frankly, after all these years, like between me, my staff, our relationships, cities are made up of people we all went to graduate school with and we were all in planning school or somebody knows someone in one place or we met at a professional function just like any other networking or we happen to have had a project there. We developed a relationship with the staff and then we can do the next project and the next project and the next project. Um, and and it, it it's the same as any other business. Politically, we don't necessarily have relationships everywhere, but I have a cadre of partner lobbying firms and other people that if we need someone on the ground in La Mirada, that I, I would go to somebody local and source them as part of our team. And we would just do the technical. Mm -hmm. That answer the question? Yeah, no, it absolutely does. Um, and so what part of your business is, um, you know, code interpretation and sort of the nuts and bolts of, of filling out forms, but it's more than filling out forms. It's, it's, it's understanding what can be built versus um, the relationship aspect and the, the, the ha having the relationships with the city officials. So I think for me personally, as I've grown a company and my reputation, I think, stands for itself and my knowledge, most of my time is spent on relationships, political relationships, making calls to supervisors and doing higher level work. My staff are doing all of the day in, day out. I think, you know, it's probably... My personal work is probably maybe 35 to 40% technical and the rest is, is some kind of 
client management, relationship management, um, lobbying. And I do a lot of work just on um, codes, ordinances, working with cities on finessing, you know, various whatever, a little bit of Sacramento work and spent time on, on efforts that help make our job easier to the extent we can. Right, where where I do a lot of that, um, task forces, et cetera, uh, that are all then beneficial to our clients. Cause then I can say, oh yes, we just, you know, it was just in a workshop with county staff on X, Y, and Z. And we know what's coming down in terms of a code change, or we know what's coming down from Sacramento. And then how do you how do you reconcile that against a pending project? And say, hey, listen, if you wait three months, this law is going to be in effect. So let's help you get to a place where you can take advantage of something three months from now instead of today. Right. A lot of that. Yeah. Now, you know, the the perception and perceptions are created based on, you know, people's experiences is that it is tough to do business in L.A. It is tough to develop in L.A. I mean, can can you share? And I know you have, you do business with all these cities, but how some of the smaller cities uh, do business versus LA, or maybe the perception that LA it's hard to develop in LA is it is it accurate? Um, thousand percent accurate. Uh, had just came out of a. a conversation slash bitch session with some colleagues of mine. Um, we said in, in 30 years, this is the hardest it's ever been. City Today is, is the hardest it's ever been. Hardest it's ever been, even with everything coming out of the state. Hardest it's ever been. Um, hardest, hardest, hardest it's ever been. The development environment is brutal. The regulatory environment is brutal. The lack of institutional knowledge in a lot of these cities is overwhelming. Um, The pace at which uh, laws are coming out of Sacramento is too fast for most planners to even grasp and understand. And the cities then have to like, it's so reactionary and it's always been reactionary. But the world of litigation is so prevalent that even the cities are running scared of potential litigation. We are honestly trying to do as much work outside of the city of L.A. as possible these days. I want to do work anywhere but the city of L.A. because these smaller jurisdictions that used to be impossible to get things done because they are so small minded have sort of flipped into a place where they're eager for investment and they're eager for people that are willing to do something. Right. I'll give a shout out to my my dear friend, John Ramirez, who's the planning director and community development director in Norwalk. We took a project through. We got it entitled in seven weeks and they got us building permits in eight weeks. They were what, like, type of, what type of project? It was a restaurant, like okay. fast food, but very, very, very high profile flagship national company. A national chain. But national, we, right? Yeah. And like then over backwards and we came back and I said, like, what else can we do in this city? Like, like what else can we do? And what else can we do in the, in the amazing city of Norwalk that has all this stuff going on? And I think right? The, we're seeing that sort of trend in Culver City. We're seeing Santa Monica be much more, much easier to develop in. Santa Monica is very progressive these days. We're seeing West Hollywood be a lot easier to develop in. We have a ton of work in Inglewood. And even, even when things are slower, it's predictable and reliable. And the ball doesn't move like it does in the city. And so, so we're actually shifting, you know, marketing and business development efforts to, to Northern California and places that pre-pandemic, we didn't have the ability to work, but over virtual, we can now do work in, you know, Modesto and we can do work in you know, places that we were never able to do it because we know code, you know, so there's been a real shift in in where we're seeing opportunity. And as people decide they don't want to be in LA either because it's too competitive, it's too hard and it's too risky. So in in this 
world in Southern California where we're, we have a housing crisis and affordability crisis and the mayor, Karen Bass, is that's her number one issue, combating homelessness and uh, providing affordable housing to Los Angelinos. Yet at the same time, hearing from you, hearing from my development clients, say it's almost impossible to build in the city. I just don't understand how the two can coexist. Um, great question, because I don't understand it either, right? And when well, we- And if you don't understand it, then it's we're in trouble. We we get pushback. We, you know, there's a directive, like a very clear mayor's directive that says, here's processing times. We just 100% affordable housing project took us eight months to get an approval that by the mayor's directive had to be issued in 60 days. Staff just don't care. We go to building and safety and we say it's supposed to be streamlined. And they're like, we don't care, get in line. Right. So there's this institutional, like, we can't help people if we don't have like-minded resources on the city side to help prioritize. So it, is it because they don't have enough resources? There's not enough people working in these departments? It's resource challenge and it's a lack of, frankly, knowledge um, in, in, right, inability to keep up. Um, density bonus law changed January 1st. It is May 14th and the city of LA still has not issued their implementation memo for how to deal with the changes in state law that came out five months ago. And they are literally not processing cases under the new law. They are holding everything up because they don't know what to do with it, even though we do, right? So when you're dealing with these like regulatory hurdles, you know, look, at the same time, I, I really you know, sympathize with the amount of work that gets put on staff at all these jurisdictions, right? There's, but there's a real, you know, sort of systemic lack of training that, that ripples down. And unfortunately, you know, the private sector, you know, lawyers, the lobbyists, people like me are, are, you know, vilified and looked at at the enemy because we represent the private sector the same way right? Developers are vilified by everybody for wanting to come in. And when I was on the commission and people would come and they would bitch about housing coming into the communities, I would say, you can't on one side be talking about the need for housing and a housing crisis and then vilify the development community. Because you know who builds houses? The development community, right? Like, so it's this sort of no-win situation where everybody who is attempting to try to solve the problem from the consultants to lawyers to developers, right, are, are sort of vilified all around and not given the support that they need to help make it easier, right? I'm sure you're here. When, when, when I go into meetings and people are complaining because a developer needs to make a profit and deals need to be underwritable and there needs to be a financing threshold that requires a profit margin. People think that that's not right. Right. And it's a business just like any other business. Like even we're a business, like I don't do this so that I can net zero. Right. right. You don't, you don't, you didn't start your company so that you could not make money. Right. Right. We all have to live in all businesses right, have a threshold and development is no different. So it, it's it's sort of this, this, I think this, this very interesting time where all around, there doesn't seem to be a willingness for everybody at the table to move forward together, right? Because there's, and so you're stuck. Development community feels like they don't have any support from cities. Cities feel like they're bombarded by the pace at which they need to respond to things. And so there's this like standstill that just isn't getting any better. Do you think things would be different based on who the mayor is? It almost sounds like it doesn't matter. No, I, I actually think that from what I see, like uh, Mayor Bass has been unbelievably proactive. The last several administrations have been very passive, right? Mm -hmm. It's been very, very, very aggressive in making clear what the priorities are. I, I, 
I don't know why when it gets out of the mayor's office, there's a disconnect with the rest of the city, right? With the rest of the cities. Um, we unfortunately and don't have the same directives in surrounding cities, right? Which are, right, you have a small city that has five council members and depending on the composition of those, you know, one year could be a very, you know, pro-development council. The next term, it could be, a, you know, and and they don't have mayors. So, right. So let's uh, pivot the conversation for a bit about builders' remedies. Can okay. you briefly explain to the audience of what builders' remedy is because we keep hearing it and I think there may be a lot there there's some misinformation about it. So I will preface this by saying I'm admittedly not not the not the expert of experts on builders remedy. But the general concept is that cities were all required to adopt a housing element that identified a a capacity to meet their arena allocation regional housing needs assessment, which SCAG um, issues every eight years. Uh, there is a timeline for which they have to have an adopted housing element, and then there's a timeline for which they need to have a corresponding zoning code update to accommodate these intensities. And there's a loophole in there that for cities that did not have an adopted housing element, et cetera, and regulation, right, in place at a certain time, right, essentially, cities are required to accept applications and process them in, con in accordance with what the future intensity provided for, even though it wasn't permitted. And so there's been a slew of applications to various jurisdictions basically coming in. Um, it, in some ways, it's a, it's a brilliant loophole, right? For those jurisdictions that sort of miss the window, um, I do think a number of those cities like that that loopholes closing. Um, but but like, what, yeah, but that's but, general, is in, as in English as I could put it. <laughs> sure. And so, what I'm reading about and hearing in 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 you know conversations that there are. Um, developers who are utilizing the builder's remedy essentially as a threat where hey i can build 30 store a 30 story building in beverly hills i can mm -hmm. build that in santa monica now because you guys missed the mark mm -hmm. and then there's litigation and then ultimately there's a settlement and a developer is going to get something much more modest than a 30 story building in in beverly hills but how serious are is this ability or how real is 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 that ability of a developer to essentially build something that is completely um would be completely atypical for these communities i mean we all know there is a classic example in santa monica right one entity came in and filed a slew of builder's remedy applications. None of them are, I don't think any of them are going forward, right? So to your point, a lot of it, a lot of it is, is scare tactics sure. to get cities to come to the table. Um, right, I think there's, there's two kinds of people we work with. There's the people that recognize people, when I say people, developers recognize that working hand in hand with staff, right? coming to a place of mutual agreement, right, will get you something that is not challenged, you get better response from staff, et cetera. In our experience, right, threatening staff only sends you to the back of the line. So I think I think it's I think it's a case by case. Um I think the number of right threats to say I'm just going to go build a 30 story high rise, at the end of the day, are you really going to build a 30 story high rise? No. <laughs> right? Like, no, it's probably not going to get financed. Right. There's then there's 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 just economic and market realities to to that. But could someone come in and say, you missed the boat filing an application on a 200 unit, 85 foot type 3A building right in the middle of downtown Santa Monica? Sure. Why not? You know, um, 
There are a couple surrounding cities where I know there have been a couple of applications filed, but they've been pretty modest proposals where I think they'll actually go for it. They're not anything that would be like a super flag. Yeah. And have you seen the state come down on any cities who have not met their housing, new housing development yeah. requirements? Yeah, HCD, Housing Community Development for People, HCD has been pretty aggressive mm -hmm. um, on cities. Um, Culver City recently lost a lawsuit. They tried to downzone what was in their housing element and they lost. It was challenged by Yimby. Um, we're seeing groups like Yimby Law, right, take up, you know, fights with cities across the state to HCD and winning. Um, HCD now has a hotline for anybody to be able to file complaints about, for lack of a better, right, for like misconduct of cities or misinterpretation or denial of projects in violation of the Housing Accountability Act. And, and these cities are getting their hands slapped, right? Um, so that's that's usually not our course of, right or right our path of action but we do have several items we've taken to hcd because we knew that the cities were dead wrong and our job is to help get these projects done and not to support staff in making decisions that are frankly in violation of local and state law like yeah when we know that they're just wrong we also have to be prepared for the consequences, which is bad relationships, right? I'm in a relationship, right? We have to be careful where we pick and choose our fights as well on stuff like that and, you know, clients, et cetera. Sure. Yeah. You know, um, I guess I want to end with this. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time, Dana. Um, you know, clients of mine will look to me sort of as a canary in the coal mine asking me, you know, how busy am I? What am I seeing trends? Uh, uh, what am I working on as, as a data point for them, whether it's lenders or capital providers or operators as to, you know, what, what are people focusing on? You know, you focus on development. Um, I guess my question is, how, are you busy? How busy are you? How does it compare to a couple of years ago because uh, in, in my world, uh, a lot of development has stopped because there's a, 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 a reduction in capital providers who are willing to do development. Um, others say this is exactly when you want to get all your entitlements done so that when development comes back and capital is ready to come back, we've got entitlement entitled projects ready to go. So I guess a long winded way of saying how busy are you? Um, Other than planning bar mitzvahs and you know, right, right. Sure. Um, we're still pretty busy. Again, I started with a pretty diversified portfolio, which I've done intentionally. So it's not all development. Um, and we right. do, do a lot of work supporting kind of the restaurant and hospitality industry. We also do more 100% affordable housing than anyone else in, in my colleagues. And that is also not market dependent because, right? So we have that constant cycle, but to that, um, I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of um, sort of deja vu back to sort of 2010, um, 2009, 2010, um, because we're on really the front end, we're kind of in a lagging where I had a ton of work all the way into 2011 when most people, most people I knew were unemployed right. or doing exactly what they're saying, which is, I'm going to tee up these approvals. It'll give me three years, et cetera. Um, so we're still seeing a lot of a lot of that, but we're seeing a lot of unsophisticated people who are not traditional developers, just like they were. There was this old adage that an old professor, um, my ex-husband's used to say, he said, when you're getting real estate advice from your dentist, it's time to get out, right? <laughs> it feels a little bit like that, like the phone calls of, you know, people graduating from school who have never done this before or so-and-so that really is like an artist and decides they want, it, it's a little haphazard. So we're seeing 
a, a, a clear exit from institutional developers, right? The big builders who've been through this before are not very active. Um, but I think what we're also seeing is a ton of projects get a ton of projects get stopped um, post entitlement and not going into construction documents because the same thing they don't they they can't find the capital or with the new um, building codes for electrification there's no power in the grids so projects don't have power which yeah. is the dynamic that we're seeing and we have several projects that are not going to proceed until they know they have cleared um will serve and have power dedicated to them which is which is i think the biggest thing that we're seeing right now it's not even the capital they've capital teed up but they can't proceed not knowing if they're going to have power or not I mean, that's crazy to think that in 2024, and we're not talking about projects that are in the boonies. No, right? we're talking about projects that are in dense areas in the middle of LA County. Dense areas in the middle, um, a, a lot of infrastructure issues, right? Mm -hmm. It's basically, right, uh, sub substandard water and sewer lines that couldn't take the intensity of development, right? If you've got, you know, you've got, AB 1287 in the city's TOC were 80% to 100% increases in density over what was planned. If you think about capacity issues, um, it's everything from infrastructure. We're, we're hearing right resources in communities about fire and police abilities to serve the, the densities. So it's a little bit more systemic, and that has nothing to do with capital markets. It has to do with municipal municipal ability to serve the intensity that's planned that also is having a real struggle that is that it could be some of the delay could be could be some of that but it's this domino effect where it doesn't matter if you have financing if you can't prove that the building can be served right yeah and prove the building can be served to get the financing and you've got it's, it's this cycle so um yes we're still busy um, but not with the same kinds of work that we were seeing a year ago. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on, Dana. I, I wanted to have you on, uh, you know, you like you built an incredible business. Uh, you and I, have, um, really have built our businesses at the same time. Um, you know, for me, you know, breaking free from, uh, big law and, and proving to the industry that, that you can have the same type of, uh, uh, law firm experience uh, in a boutique uh, law firm uh, structure, and for you, the same thing in, in the land use consulting entitlement permitting world. So, first, I just want to say congratulations uh, for all your success. I know uh, uh, when I uh, tell my clients uh, that you need to call Dana, that's the first call you need to make uh, when you're doing a development in LA County or or anywhere uh, in Southern California and and beyond. Uh, but the issue is sometimes you're a victim of your own success of how how busy you have been. Um, so I'm glad you're you're growing and uh, uh, all the success that that you've been enjoying. So congratulations. Thank you. Good to see you, Andrew. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Take care. Thanks. Take care. You've been listening to Real Talk Real Estate Discussions with Andrew Kirsch. You can catch prior episodes at scalarkirsch.com and on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. Thank you for your positive reviews, comments, and for sharing this show with others.